Okay, so I think we're going to start now. So hello, everyone. I hope you are well and looking forward to today's webinar. My name is Ifit, the DMYP for Crawley and East Grinstead, and this is the final webinar in our political engagement series, where today we'll be looking at political discourse. So I hope you're all doing well and are comfortable because we have a lot to learn from the young people today. Um, so a few quick things to mention. We have a feedback form at the end of this that will be emailed to you tomorrow. So please fill that out because it really helps us um, be able to make more of these kinds of things. And we work ever so hard as a cabinet. And uh, yeah, it would mean so much to us. It, it would take no longer than five minutes. Um, a quick plug in for our socials. You can find us on most social media sites, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Spotify, and more. Our handle is Your Space West Sussex on most of them. So check those out because we promote all sorts of things on these sites, as well as so many of our campaigns. So follow those to be informed. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this one, but if you have missed the last two webinars, uh, they're all on our YouTube channel or Your Space West Sussex. Uh, and this one will be on there in a couple of days too, if you wanna go back on it. So the structure for this evening will be a presentation by our young people, uh, a potential Q&A with them, a speech from Councillor Jackie Russell and a Q&A session with her. And we'll aim to finish at 7 to 7.15, but we have gone over before. So when it comes to the questions uh, and if it's the case that we might have to go over, we might stretch a tiny wee bit. Um, so that is all from me. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lottie and Katerina, who will be doing their presentation on political discourse. And we hope you enjoy and learn a lot. Thank you, Ifat. So welcome to our webinar on political discourse. Political discourse are speeches and texts produced by political leaders, parties and the public for political reasons such as debate. Although this mainly covers written word and speech, actions like protests and political demonstrations are also political discourse. Political discourse also really refers to when there's a problem in society and the steps that are taken to address it. This involves exchanging opposing or alternate views to find the course of action that should be taken. It's something MPs engage in every day, usually through debate in the House of Commons where they create a speech to argue their point of view. Here are some examples of political discourse such as protest speeches and written manifestos. So, however, political discourse doesn't just take place in the House of Commons. So we, the public, we carry out political discourse every day. Um, so every political conversation we take in, we partake in, um, protests, joining a pressure group, reading an opinion article, watching the news, they're all forms of political discourse because they involve exchanging opposing views. So one of the most familiar types of political discourse is obviously the MPs debating in the House of Commons. But there are also many other participants in our democracy. So we have the media, we have pressure groups, we have political parties and activists, we have academic experts, think tanks. Um, and other examples of political discourse include pamphlets, leaflets and written text to like widely distribute ideas. So things like political party manifestos. Freedom of speech is the right to say whatever you like about whatever you choose whenever you want to, right? Well, this isn't entirely true. Freedom of speech is defined as the right to seek, receive and pass on information and ideas of all kinds by any means. This applies to ideas of all kinds, even those deemed deeply offensive. However, there are limits to this and hate speech is restricted by law, especially if it's deemed to contains language that encourages racial or religious hatred, terrorism or hatred due to sexuality, or if it contains threatening, abusive or insulting words or behaviour that causes or is likely to cause another person distress, alarm or harassment. But any restrictions placed on freedom of speech by a business, for example, have to follow three rules. Any limitations must be found in law and must be necessary to democracy and be proportionate. Freedom of speech is the foundation of any democratic society. The right to express our opinions, especially those which cr criticize the government are vital. Freedom of speech is in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, made in 1945 as a reaction to the oppression of free speech and expression seen before the war, such as in Nazi Germany and Italy. 
human rights to protect the freedom of expression are not absolute rights. They may be restricted to protect other rights or for other serious reasons. Speech that's used to intimidate, to blackmail or to incite hatred is forbidden by law and carries criminal penalties. Defamatory speech, where you damage someone's reputation in a way that is untruthful, is also forbidden by law and carries penalties such as compensation, but is not a criminal offence. Limitations on the freedom of speech that are set by companies have to be very carefully checked and must follow these rules. This is to stop businesses, employers and people in authority overstepping the line and violating human rights of their employees. Offensive speech is all around us, but is not unlawful and it does not result in penalties. Do you, should this be changed? Before we discuss this, we will have a poll about whether you think you have the right to offend. So it's very interesting to see the results of the poll come in. It's about a 50-50 split between yes and no, which is very interesting. Um, so, so I see that most of us think that um, we, do not, we don't have the right to offend, which is interesting because the main, the general answer the general answer of whether we have the right to offend is yes, because the freedom of speech will always allow the right to offend. But it's important to point out that a right isn't a duty. and um, We all have a duty as citizens to um, listen to other people's point of view and understand them, especially those of like minority groups and such as the Muslim and LGBT community who are most, most at risk of being mistreated by the freedom of speech. Um, also, there's a clear difference between doing something because you should and doing something because you could. And obviously being obsessed with only your rights without really considering the responsibilities that they come with can create arrogance and division. And the right to offend is something that does come up a lot on social media. So for an, an example, for when someone's freedom of speech was shut down, perhaps unlawfully, was when a 20 year old Matthew Woods was arrested and jailed for three months in 2012 because he posted bad jokes about a missing girl, uh, Madeline McCann which many seem as a violation of the freedom of speech, as it doesn't necessarily intimidate or threaten anyone or follow the restrictions that we discussed in the last slide. And just because we find something offensive or it makes us angry, it shouldn't necessarily be used as, as an excuse to shut down someone else's freedom of speech. Um, but if it is found to violate hate speech laws, then it could be illegal. How do we prevent our social medias from becoming echo chambers? Echo chamber describes what happens when someone's belief systems are reinforced by continually seeing informational stories that reinforce what they believe. While the internet opened up limitless opportunities to educate ourselves by wider access to news and information, it also allowed us to select what information we can access, especially on social media. This is dangerous as it limits the range of information we see. For example, while a simple Google search related to a topic such as immigration would show a diversity of viewpoints to consider this issue from different angles. The internet also allows people to only seek out information that reinforces what they believe. For example, a study found that 61% of 15 to 24 year olds get their main source of news from social medias. This is concerning as social media is governed by algorithms which can pick up on our interests and get rid of content that does not appears not to fit with our preferences. So every time we use social media, algorithms are producing content that fit more and more in what we believe. This, is a, this way of searching information uh, not only reinforces existing views and ideas, but can also lead to deep divides in society and unfortunate examples of extremism, as it means that you block out all other views and could lead to people being unable to cope or accept different viewpoints. How do you prevent your social media from becoming an echo chamber? Avoid unfollowing people if they post the opposite view to you. You could also use a fact checker to check any facts you might see to see if they are true. 
Also, I would recommend Googling a statement that is being presented as a fact to see if it's true or not. It is up to us to do our own research. Follow accounts that reflect a wide range of political views. This increases the range of ideas you're exposed to and following trusted, respected news outlets. Avoid being influenced by fake news. Also, it means that you're la less likely to be targeted by personal ads that are made to fit your beliefs, as algorithms cannot pinpoint exactly what you believe. You could also get offline and limit your time on social media during the day. Not everything on the world is as awful as social media makes it out to be, and setting time limits can reduce the amount of negative content you absorb and prevents doom scrolling, where fear and anger inducing content can cause anxiety and reduce sleep. Limiting social media is beneficial for your mental health. It massively increases sleep and productivity. Getting offline allows you to spend time with yourself and figure out what you actually think without other people's, other people's opinions influencing you. It's a good idea to spend the first 10 minutes of the day in silence with yourself before using your phone. So allowing, so tolerance can be defined as allowing the existence of other people's beliefs, actions, or practices, even if we don't follow, agree, or even like them. So tolerance is one of the five core British values, and it's so important because it allows people to live how they choose to, and means minority groups are not forced to live a certain way by the majority. So this obviously helps to maintain human rights. Um, but there is an interesting question about whether, because the tolerance itself means that we should tolerate everything. So there is a good um, ethical debate actually surrounding whether we should tolerate intolerant ideas. So now we have a poll about whether you think a tolerant society should tolerate intolerant ideas. It's a bit of a tongue twister. So the most popular one was yes, that we should tolerate intolerant ideas, which is very interesting because then it, it um, weighs up, should you, if we're tolerant, but then should we tolerate people who are intolerant? By definition, complete tolerance in society would mean the toleration of intolerant ideas. Philosophers like Karl Popper call this the tolerance paradox. By completely tolerating intolerant ideas, Karl Popper says, unlimited tolerance always leads to the disappearance of tolerance. This is because if we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, and we're not prepared to defend our tolerant society from the attack of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be eventually destroyed and the tolerance with them. An example of how tolerating intolerant ideas in society, such as hate speech, can be dangerous is seen in Nazi Germany. In the 1920s, the intolerant views against Jews, disabled people, the traveling community and racial minorities became more supported and normalized. It eventually led to Hitler getting power in 1933, where he gradually reduced freedom of speech and press, starting with banning making jokes against him in 1939. And by 1938, all press, letters, radios and books that the Nazis didn't like were banned. So in four years through passing laws, Hitler abolished the civil rights of freedom of speech and press in Germany, which led to atrocities like the Holocaust. So this is just, I thought it was a really good picture um, showing what would happen if the society was too accepting of intolerant ideas like hate speech, um, using the example of Nazi Germany. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to, is it ever okay to limit the freedom of speech to not offend someone? So I would say, I mean, there are obviously very good arguments for and against, but to determine if ideas are acceptable enough to be heard, we have to hear them first. 
and also there's the dilemma of who do we choose like who who has the right to tell someone what we should and shouldn't listen to and it's also important to note that ideas that are described as offensive have massively changed over time so 700 years ago um John Wycliffe was banished from Oxford University for translating the Bible into English so peasants could read it. And this was described as deeply offensive to the church. Um, 200 years ago, the famous poet Shelley was also banned from Oxford for sharing a booklet he wrote on why he doesn't believe in God. And this was described as causing maximum offense. Um, and Nicolaus Copernicus um, discovered that like contrary to popular belief at the time, that the earth was not the center of the universe and actually orbited around the sun. And this is called the heliocentric theory. And this was met with a lot of opposition, especially from the Protestant church. And they ended up banning his theory in the 17th century, even though obviously it later turned out to be correct. So in these examples, causing offense has led to change and pushed ideas forward, which we accept today. So in history, sometimes going against or offending religious, natural and moral standards have led to progress. So another example is Charles Darwin, who obviously greatly offended the church when he published his book, An Original Species, which suggested that humans evolved from ape-like ancestors rather than created by God. And however, his ideas obviously today have been scientifically proven and are largely accepted even by the church, which is an example of how offending has driven society and science forward. Um, and also forms of expression that offend some people barely register with others, like certain swear words or gestures, and forms of expression that are taken as routine and commonplace by many people offend others. So therefore, offence is very subjective and in the eye of the beholder. So any attempts to make certain types of offensive speech unlawful would place everybody's freedom of speech at the mercy of others, which therefore threaten everyone's freedom of speech. But this does not mean that there's nothing to be done when we find other speech is offensive. It only means that, like, apart from the exceptions that we mentioned, Freedom of speech is an area that cannot be classed as a criminal offence, but there are other consequences of offensive speech, like losing your job. Um, and there's also lots of good reasons not to speak in any way that will offend others, like good manners. Um, and there are a lot of effective ways to react when other people are speaking in ways that we find offensive. So, for example, speaking to those to, who are saying the offensive speech because a lot of the time they do not realise how or why their speech would offend. They may stop speaking in those ways, apologise, or maybe they might explain why they said what they did. And in some cases, they may even show that there were good reasons to express themselves as they did. Sharing views adds to the political conversation. It's important to look at all sides of an argument or a political point. It helps us to see the world in a different way and educate ourselves on important issues. I think that it's really important to remember that politics should be a conversation and not an argument. If every time we have a conversation with someone who disagrees with us and it turns into an argument with name calling, we'd never solve any problems in society. That's why MPs, when debating in the House of Commons, have strict rules they must follow so that their debate is as constructive and as useful as possible. Discussion is always better than an argument because an argument is to find out who is right but a discussion is to find out what is right. So large famous protests like the 2003 Stop the Wall protest against the Iraq war um, appeared to fail because obviously the war went ahead anyway despite two million protesters. It was the largest protest in the UK. Another example is the 2019 second breath second Brexit referendum protest, which had a 1 million attendees, and obviously this failed to spark another referendum. So do protests actually work? Um, well, new research from Harvard University shows that protests do actually have a major influence in politics, but not necessarily due to the big crowd sending a message to the government in charge of these decisions, but they encourage people to be more politically active. So a 2009 protest in the USA on tax increases called the Tea Party protests, they brought about 800,000 protests, protesters in total in 500 different districts. So the top four districts with the highest turnout, so the largest protests, were 300 times more likely to elect a Republican Congress person who are also against tax increases than the four districts with the smallest protest. 
So this shows that the larger the protest, the more people are motivated to vote for leaders who support their ideas, which in turn makes a huge change. And also, obviously, protests draw huge media attention, which puts even more pressure on politicians to give in to demands, often when these protests are met with strikes. So historically, protests are a lot more likely to be successful when they're peaceful and when they're confined with strikes, which is obviously when people refuse to work, which puts huge economic pressures on the government. So an example of this, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this, is the um, Montgomery bus strikes when Rosa, Pike, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery in Atlanta. And her defiant act sparked a boycott where for one whole year, 40,000 African-Americans refused to take the bus, which was 75% of their customers. So this put a lot of pressure to have the laws changed to give greater human rights to African-Americans and to spread the message that all people deserve equal rights. So this protest led to the US Supreme Court, US Supreme Court ruling only a year later in 1956 that segregation on public buses was unconstitutional. A pressure group is a group that tries to influence policies made by the government in favour of a particular cause, such as the environment. Most of them are free and open to public membership. However, they vary in how effective they are in getting things done to support their cause, usually down to many factors, including how much support from the public they have. They often host campaigns such as Extinctions Rebellion's campaign against the London Fashion Week for using real animal furs. They also fund research to further their cause, such as the WWF or the World Wildlife Fund, which has funded research into how multinational companies such as Heinz are causing the destruction of the rainforest. Pressure groups like Age UK don't really support one particular cause, but rather represent a group of people and support their interests. In this case, Age UK represents the elderly. Age UK is an example of an insider pressure group which refers to a group that has direct access to the government and often holds conferences with them. Recently, Age UK have held conferences with the government and are trying to convince them to continue allowing the elderly a free BBC TV license due to plans from the government to scrap them. However, there are outsider pressure groups such as Animal Liberation Front, which is a pressure group concerned with animal rights which do not enjoy direct access to the government, and so will have a hard time actually creating change. Sometimes when pressure groups appear too radical, they can put the public and the government off supporting them. There are many benefits of joining pressure groups, and especially at our age group where we can't vote, it's a vital way of being involved in politics. So pressure, group, pressure groups have a really important role in holding the government responsible for their actions and draws attention to how their policies, sometimes unintentionally, can affect others. Um, they also have a useful role because um, many pressure groups are supported by researchers, so they provide the government with useful information to help them make their decisions. So, for example, research by the Child Poverty Action Group on child hunger helped push um, for the government to continue to provide free school meals for children during school holidays, so during the December 2020, and for them to provide laptops for disadvantaged kids so they could do online school. And um, this expertise is very effective in passing laws as it puts their point across effectively and convincingly. Um, also, it's important for minorities because it gives them a voice in lawmaking. So this was seen during the 2010 student protests against raising university fees, the 2003 Stop the War Iraq protests, and the pressure group, the Muslim Council of Britain is often consulted in Parliament. And also, I think it's important to mention that it allows people to support more specific, fine-tuned views, because unlike political parties, where people may only vote for a party when they only support a few out of their ideas, with pressure groups, you can choose what issues matter to you and exactly what pressure group to join based on where you stand on them. And it gives you more of a say on what happens and what ideas matter to you most. And also pressure groups are free to join in a good way of meeting like-minded people. However, there are some limits to how effective pressure groups can be, especially when there are groups that have opposing interests, as it means that the government will have to compromise. For example, the League Against Cruel Sports has been trying to persuade the government to outright ban hunting, 
where the Countryside Alliance has been calling for the ban to be scrapped. In the past, pressure groups have been seen to cause violence, which puts the government and public off supporting them. For example, Fathers for Justice have trespassed onto Buckingham Palace and PETA has threatened lab workers with fake explosives. Negatives of pressure groups include wealthy groups that represent certain workers, such as bankers, tend to have insider links to parliament and so can squeeze out the voices of the smaller, less wealthy groups. Offensive views are another disadvantage of pressure groups. Although there's a democratic right to freedom of expression, some pressure groups still have offensive views, which could stir up community tensions. Furthermore, having offensive views can normalise these views and could lead them to being more widely accepted, especially because groups with more radical views tend to get more media attention. An example of this is the English Defence League and Britain First, which have racist views against Muslims and want to ban religious dress such as the hijab. Another disadvantage is that many pressure groups cause disruption to get their views heard and become violent or cause civil disobedience where they try and get attention through publicity stunts and protests. These disrupt public life and cost a lot in policing. An example of this is in October 2019 when three protesters from an environmental group, Extinction Rebellion, disrupted the London Underground during the rush hour by climbing on top of trains. This backfired and made many commuters and people using the underground angry by causing huge delays, so reduced public support for the group. So I think it's really important to mention media because media is such has such a vital role in our democracy, especially as it scrutinizes the government and provides different viewpoints on important issues. So, however, like some some forms of media, like TV news programs, are bound by law to be balanced and neutral. So they must present a broad range of political opinion and allow both sides of an argument to be heard. Um, and this applies both the publicly owned and so we pay for them with our taxes and um, beat the BBC and privately owned news broadcasters like Sky News and ITV News. And this is a huge contrast to the USA where the, their First Amendment right to free speech allows broadcasters to be highly biased. So such as the conservative Fox News and the more liberal CNN. And this also brings up how um, concerns about how factual their reporting is, because I'm not sure if you've watched US news, but a lot, of the, a lot of the time it is simply political commentators kind of giving their take on an issue without providing much facts. And um, Fox News garnered up a lot of criticism um, last year and this year um, for peddling um, the, the conspiracy that the 2020 presidential election was fraudulent. Um, when there was no evidence supporting this. And also highly partisan news can add to political divides as it in increases the echo chamber that people are exposed to because similar to newspapers, they will only pick broadcasters whose views they align with. So I think having like neutral broadcasters in the UK is something we, could be, we should be grateful for. Um, and other forms of media like newspapers can publish pretty much what they like. Obviously there are legal restrictions, but they aren't required to be balanced. So, um, however, sometimes the media ca can break the law with their reporting. So um, in 2011, there was a phone hacking scandal where one of the biggest newspapers at the time, the News of the World, were found to have accessed the mobile phones and voicemails, and in some cases had burgled the properties of over 4,000 celebrities. And they had access to medical records, pin numbers, phone numbers, voicemails, and were creating stories based on these. And there's also police corruption. So the, the newspaper had bribed some police officers, £100,000 for news stories. And this also included murder victims. And um, this obviously led to the newspaper being shut down. And some victims of the phone hacking include members of the royal family, famous politicians and families of murder victims. So um, Tony Blair, Boris Johnson, Bruno Mars, Brad Pitt and Prince William were all victims. Um, so now I thought it'd be interesting to talk about whether media actually affects voting. Um, so voting behaviour is obviously influenced by many different things, but obviously media is our main source of information and we don't exist in a vacuum, so the media does play an important role in determining how we vote. Um, so as discussed in the previous slide, unlike broadcasting, newspapers can hold political positions and take sides, and the political leanings of newspapers are well known. So The Sun, which is the most popular newspaper in the UK, has 1.9 million readers. And the Daily Mail and the Telegraph are consistent conservative supporters, whereas the Mirror and the Guardian usually favour the Labour Party. 
So overall, newspapers do have quite a strong right wing bias because they the majority support the Conservative Party. Um, but the restrictions going back to broadcasting, the restrictions on like UK broadcast media might suggest that they might have little impact on voting behaviour. But some critics argue that broadcasters can influence voting behaviour by giving more time to certain politicians, parties or policies and give one side more um, like factual backing and airtime. And um, some interviewers could like signal to the audience that certain political ideas are too risky or controversial. And they may also choose interviewees who are more on the extreme side so they can invalidate their argument as, rad as too radical. And an important concept to consider is the Overton window, which refers to the range of political ideas that are considered to be acceptable in the public in general discussion. So um, politicians try and, and to maximise their chance of re-election, usually like determine where um, the Overton window is for key policy issues. And obviously this can be changed through media, crisis events such as COVID, social movements and research will help to shift this window. And obviously this window has shifted shifted hugely over time. Um, you know, women getting the right to vote was once an extreme radical idea and now it's universally accepted. And social media has also shifted this window by giving a voice to and fostering communities among groups that were kind of failed to be heard in the past. So, um, but there are also um, concerns about who owns the media. So the five most popular new UK newspapers are owned by five billionaires. So The Sun is owned by Rupert Murdoch, Daily Mail by Jonathan Harmsworth and The Telegraph by two billionaires called the Barclay Brothers. And some say that these billionaires have vested interests and so will manipulate their readers into supporting um, far right capitalist ideas and conservative politicians because they tend to support their interests like lowering taxes on the rich. However, despite newspapers having clear bias, it's not actually clear whether this bias translates into them actually influencing voting. So there is a theory that perhaps newspapers just simply reflect the views of their readers. So, so that's why people buy them. So um, conservative leaning voters are much more likely to choose a paper that support their ideas. So 79% of Telegraph readers voted conservative, conservative in the 20, 2017 general election. So they may made, they made read the Telegraph because they vote conservative rather than the Telegraph in influencing them to vote conservative. Um, also, with the same election, one of the front pages of The Sun had an anti-Labour slogan saying, don't truck Britain in the Corbyn, but 30% of its readers ignored it and voted Labour anyway. So there are large evidence, but there is large evidence of influence. So during the 2016 Bre Brexit referendum, unlike broadcast media, which, which um, gave a lot of airtime to academic experts and big businesses that were saying the UK would be better off in the EU, the press disagreed and the Sun, Daily Mail and Telegraph all published pro leave front pages for their combined readership of 4.2 million. So this led to a surprising victory for the leave campaign. Um, also, media is having increasing influence in politics, um, especially in social media. So this is particularly important for young people because 50% um, of 18 to 24 year olds claims it influences their vote, whereas only 28% said it was influenced by newspapers. So um, there are different strategies how political parties can utilize media. So in 2017, Labour had used social media effectively um, because it, although it had much lower spending on their social media campaign than the rival party, the Conservatives, it had a, more, much, a lot more effective strategy. So Labour used 1,200 different social media adverts to micro-target specific groups of voters based on their jobs, their ages, and this might explain the surge in the youth vote in the 2017 election. So it went from 43% in 2015 to 58% in 2017, and the fact that 63% of 18 to 24 year olds voted Labour. But there are problems with this type of advertising because, um, especially seeing as how these campaigns are able to obtain such complex personal data, such as your job, your ethnicity, religion, and to what point we have free will casting a vote, because it's not just and it's not just someone else's, you know, cleverly crafted political ads during the voting for us. So during the 2016 presidential election, the Trump campaign had created eight categories of tailored political adverts. And one of these was labeled deterrence, which was publicly described by Trump's chief data scientist as containing people the campaign hope don't show up to vote. 
So when analysed, it showed that 54% of this category were from minorities and 3.5 million were black Americans. So whereas categories um, where the voters were, where the campaign was wishing to attract voters were overwhelmingly white. Um, so in this way, social media is used maliciously or can be used maliciously as a form of voter suppression and can undermine someone's free will when it comes to voting. I think it definitely muddies the water of who is really responsible for an individual's decision making. But, you know, at the end of the day, voting is a private act and we can never be 100% sure how much influence the media have. Um, newspapers openly tell their readers how to vote, but as we saw in The Sun, many don't listen. Um, so broadcasters claim to be neutral, but they can still play a key role in setting the Overton window and social media is increasingly important, especially for younger voters. But this is a challenge as social media platforms allow the boom of fake news. Um, they can also have unwelcome foreign in inference interference in elections. So there were concerns about um, Russia funding into the Trump campaign because they did pay, I think it was £100,000 for a lot of these Facebook adverts. And um, but also it provides social media provides greater greater opportunity for participation, higher youth turnout, and it would certainly force political parties to focus more on young people who are often left out of the discussion. It's so important that we set out to have conversations with those at different viewpoints, even if you completely disagree with them. This opens our minds and stops deep divides growing in society. But how do we talk to people we disagree with? Firstly, debate promotes unity. So it's important to talk to people that we disagree with and to know how to talk to them without having an argument. So you shouldn't assume that they have bad intentions. This instantly cuts us off from truly understanding why someone does and believes as they do. But we forget that they're a human being with a lifetime of experience that has shaped their minds. So don't get stuck on the first wave of anger. And the second thing you can do is to ask questions. This helps us to map out what areas we disagree in, and it also helps us to understand their moral values and why they believe the things they do. Is it because of their religion, their environment, or their upbringing? It's important to understand both sides of the arguments so that you can come to an agreement. This also helps someone believe that they are being heard and that we are interested in their responses. So some more advice I would we would say would be to definitely stay calm and avoid avoid personal attacks because um, these like personal and unrelated remarks would only make them less likely to take on board your ideas and so it's very counterproductive and also it's important to make your argument obviously that's the whole point of, of the debate is to make your argument um, but I think you know having strong beliefs we automatically assume that they are obvious and we shouldn't have to defend our views as we think they're right and good but if this was simple, like if that was, if it was that simple, we would all agree. So we actually have to make our points in order to get someone to see the world in a different way. And I think it's important to realize that we are all the results of our upbringings and our beliefs reflect our experiences. So we can't expect others to instantly change their minds, but if we want change, we have to make the case for it. So I would definitely say use reliable facts in your case. And if you can tell them where you got it from. And in political debate, it's important to convince them that what you are suggesting on a certain issue doesn't necessarily completely go against their beliefs and so by this you're appealing to what they already believe in so the example i came up with is that if you're debating someone against increasing taxes and they say that they it's because they want to keep their own money you could say that if anything happens to them like an accident serious illness or a job loss and that means that they might lose their own money then increasing taxes could provide a safety net as it funds services like food banks council homes and universal credit which obviously can help them in the future and help many other unfortunate people. So using this example, it's important to appeal to what people already believe in. Um, so now we're going to introduce our guest speaker, Jackie Russell, um, who is a member of the West Sussex County Council. Thank you so much, Lottie. Um, I'm gonna welcome Jackie now. Um, yeah, both of you did really well and I hope everyone's learned a lot. So make sure you guys remember to put questions in the Q&A box because that is, so um, we can ask Lottie and Katerina later as well as ask Jack. So over to you now. 
Okay, thanks very much, Ifat. Well, as, as everybody's already said, my name is Jackie Russell and I'm the county councillor that represents the residents of East Grinstead South and Ashurst Wood. Um, I'm also the current cabinet member for children and young people at West Sussex County Council. I thought to start with, I would talk about my road to politics and how my political leanings were shaped through life and to try and give some insight into how we interact as councillors in council. Uh, particularly from the perspective of communication and language and give you some advice uh, to any of you who are considering uh, a role in politics. So in terms of my role road to politics, I've been a county councillor since I was elected in 2017, but I first came into local government in 2015 as an East Grinstead Town Councillor for the Ward of Ashplatz. My entry into local government was quite unusual in the sense that I was at work one day and suddenly received an email into my inbox and when I read it to my immediate surprise it transpired that without telling me my husband had been speaking to a member of the local Conservative Party and he had told them I'd be happy to stand for election as a Conservative Town Councillor. My initial reaction to that was you know stand for election you know what, what have you done and uh, he just laughed and said to me you've always had an interest in politics and you've always had plenty to say on the subject. And so in that sense, um, I thought he had a point in that if anybody was going to uh, stand for politics, it would be somebody like me, you know, who was constantly writing to the government of the day about anything. And uh, he would often come home from work on occasion, see a letter ready to be sent off to 10 Downing Street and sigh, you know, what are you writing about now? Uh, and this, I think, coupled with the fact that I was already, already very quite active in my community, uh, I used to help coach at the local athletics club and I was very involved with them, the business association and other other community things. I just made hit. I think he gave me the push really that I needed to channel my political energy, if you like, uh, to better use and stand for election to try and make even more of a dif difference for people. So after a bit of thought and persuasion, I agreed to stand and I was elected in May 2015. And during my time at East Grinstead Town Council, I undertook the role of Chairman of Planning. So, um, you know, we formed representative views uh, on behalf of our residents in, uh, with respect to planning, uh, planning, uh, planning applications. And then I was briefly the leader of the Town Council uh, before I was elected to the County Council in 2017. And then I subsequently stood down from Town Council in 2019 to concentrate on my County Council role. So, you know, why am I a Conservative councillor? Well, for as long as I remember, um, I've always been interested in politics. Um, I consider myself actually to be fairly centrist politically or perhaps um, just right of centre. And uh, I attribute this largely to the events that occurred in my childhood, which from a political standpoint was uh, within quite a staunch socialist environment. Um, I had a pretty tough time growing up anyway. But looking back on this period in my life, um, I think I'm confirmed in my belief that our life experiences shape not only the person we become, but to a degree also our politics, whether we take the stand or not. And that ultimately we all in society have the chance to turn any negative experiences into something positive. So I look back on my childhood experiences all those years ago and think some of them actually stood me in very good stead for the role that I'm currently undertaking in local government, particularly from an empathetic perspective. So in terms of why I'm a member of the Conservative Party as opposed to any other party, I think probably boils down to several things and, and that were the effects of my early upbringing, my aspirations for myself and family and my aspirations for us as a society, I feel lean in that direction. And um, to put that into some context, I thought I'd share a bit about my, my background, my early background. So I grew up on a council estate in South London in a two bedroom flat. Our flat was tied to my father's job as a caretaker on a housing estate that we lived on. In addition, I grew up with a mother who suffered with serious mental health issues from, an early met from, um, from my earliest memories. And uh, she spent a lot of time in hospital when I was very young. But for a short while in between bouts of illness, she managed to work in a local supermarket where she became a very active trade union shop steward with political perspective, which I would say is considerably to the left of mine. Um, and one that actually I, I quite struggled to identify with from an early age. 
But if I'm honest, I'd say my mother was a profound influence in terms of helping me to determine where my principles stood. She would often tell me that I was, you know, working class and not to forget it. Oh, why would you vote conservative? You have nothing to conserve. And, you know, that, that would be sort of seen to be, you know, quite offensive um, today. Um, but this only provoked my curiosity as to what else was out there. And although her words have stuck with me as a reminder of her pol particular political mindset, they made me more determined to see what else was out there and to make up my own mind. So I felt slightly politically alienated within the family because there appeared to be this natural expectation then for me to vote for the Labour Party because I lived on a council estate in a poor part of London, purely because my family had always voted this way. And as we all know, you know, that that's not really the case in life. That's not the way it works. And so when decades later um, I became a Conservative County Councillor, I can remember my cousin remarking rather tongue in cheek that my grandfather, a staunch Labour activist in his day, would be turning in his grave at the thought of me being a Conservative. Although if I'm completely honest, I'm sure that wouldn't really be the case uh, if I met him now. The stark reality is that I believe is that when it comes down to it, the majority of us are not a million miles apart in what we want and what we are trying to achieve for our society. We just have different views and opinions on how to achieve what we want to achieve. So from a very young age, I had three ambitions as a child. When I grew up, I wanted to be a midwife. I wanted to live in a house that if I were to act with a garden and that if I was to get married, uh, I'd have a husband who would be good at everything around the house and fix it when I needed. So I achieved two of the three ambitions predominantly due to, to a change in life circumstances uh, around the early death of my father, actually. He died from cancer when I was 17 and there was a need for me to become my mother's sole carer, which was very difficult when trying to hold down a job at the same time. So I found myself in a position where I had to take any job I could find to earn money to contribute to the household. And I got a job with a large supermarket chain, worked my way up and uh, met my husband who was uh, involved in the construction industry. We moved to London, from London to Sussex and had a family. And thereafter, I spent the majority of my working life involved in construction at some level. And any ideas of being a midwife had regrettably, regrettably long been abandoned. So when I look back at my childhood now, I find it quite ironic that in today's world, um, I'd likely be considered either a vulnerable child or a young carer in a troubled family. And here I am now in local government role as an elected member, holding the political arm of the authority's statutory duty in children's services to ensure we give our vulnerable children and families the very best support and outcomes when they need us most, which actually feels a bit like I've come full circle in a lot of ways on a personal level. And having held this complex post for nearly 18 months, I've learned so much, and I can certainly say that compared to 40 or 50 years ago, regardless of whichever party is, has been in power, as a society, we've come a very long way. But the pressures of life at any stage are relative to their moment in time. And overall, I would say that on balance, it is not necessarily easier today than it was yesterday. And as an example, and speaking purely from a personal experience in terms of attitudes towards mental health in particular, I'd say we are probably in a significantly better place today than we were 40 or 50 years ago in terms of society's attitudes, when it was considered almost shameful and wicked to attempt to take your own life and was a very taboo subject with no support at all for the affected family, never mind the children. So in that respect, I feel that collectively we've come very, very far, um, but there's always room for improvement. So um, in terms of advice on entering politics, you know, what would I give any of you considering taking up a, a, a role? Well, I thought, first of all, it would be worth talking a bit about the role and working with councillors from other political parties, which I know you've touched on today. Um, my observations over the last four years in county council, whether as a backbencher or cabinet member, is that we sit on the right or the left politically. But there is a common view um, that we're all there to do the best for our residents, irrespective of where we sit. Very local issues and decisions can come down to the local member, uh, giving them their support. And any major strategic changes proposed by the authority go through scrutiny committees, which have a cross-party membership. And on many occasions, there will also be public consultation before final decisions are made by the ruling cabinet. 
And one example of that currently is my portfolio involving the proposals for the redesign of the early help service. Outside of the public arena of the council chamber, I would say that by and large, with a few exceptions, the majority of councillors do try to work together in a very constructive manner. I've worked with some very good people who sit on the left-hand side of the chamber. And one example would, there would be Councillor Oxlade, a Crawley member of the Labour Group, who works with me as vice chair on my corporate parenting panel. Equally, I know that there are those that sit on the left of the chamber that have similar respect for colleagues who sit on the right of the chamber, even if they don't always agree. So naturally, we are now approaching an election where each party will try to get as many candidates elected as possible in order to control the authority for the next four years. So naturally, each party sets out their stall through their manifesto as to why the electorate should vote for them. The reality is that when the results are in, the electorate will expect us collectively to deliver on the needs of their residents, irrespective of the political makeup, which can sometimes be a challenge, but is something to be mindful of if you are elected to office. That is your overriding duty, politics aside. From, from a where to start perspective, I think the best place to start in politics is at the very grassroots to gain an understanding of the system. I started at the town council to understand the basic system of local government and to work out which powers each council had. There is a whole new world of process and language to be learned when you enter a life in local government. The reality is that parish councils and town councils have very little or no strategic power and are more a statutory consultee particularly in terms of planning, uh, but they do have the ability to work with their district and county council collaboratively to deliver on local issues. But if this isn't for you and you want to be in a position whereby you affect and vote on strategic policy, you have to become to ele elected to one of the upper tiers, i.e. your district or county council, each of which have their own areas of responsibility. But nonetheless, being a town councillor does give you a voice and it's an excellent grounding, particularly if you are also working full time, you are actually able to do both roles together, which are probably slightly more challenging if you become a county councillor. Um, and, and also particularly if you come from a life of working as I did within the private sector, moving into the public sector, where everything moves at a much slower pace. So I'm particularly passionate about local government. I think it gives you the best of both worlds. And I feel you remain very connected to your locality keeping in touch with residents and making a difference, whilst also taking part in strategic decision-making that, that affects, in my case, the whole county. Standing for County Council appealed to me in that its remit is in dealing with the principal foundation blocks that underpin our everyday well-being, you know, education, environment, protecting adults and children, and keeping our communities safe. I think it takes at least a year to get your head around many processes and procedures and jargons that go with that role. And when you step up to take charge of a specific area of service, as I have in the role of children's cabinet member, the learning curve becomes steeper. But overall, it is a massive privilege to be elected by your residents and is probably the most enjoyable role in my life I've ever had, apart from being a mum. So those that enter public life are bound by a code of conduct centred around seven principles known as the Nolan principles. These are selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. If you're going to become a politician on any level, you will have to adhere to these principles and try to master the skills of tact, diplomacy, patience and tenacity all at once. And that's not easy, particularly when an emotive subject comes to the fore. And I say that actually as somebody who is known for saying how it is at times and has one or two on more than one occasion, probably one or two, given herself a telling off for letting emotions get in the way. But the way, way to deal with that when that happens to you is just to reflect and just resolve to alter your approach next time. And just remember that you will never stop learning and you will continue to make mistakes. That's how we all learn. You have to be very wary of the language you use and seek to adopt an approach that is open and engaging, even if you are in complete disagreement with an opposing view. I think it's important to remain true to your beliefs, but it's also important to try to be realistic and realise that you will encounter different views and many different ways people express those views, which at times may seem unpalatable to those who are listening. Nonetheless, everybody does have a right to be heard, but I don't think that that means that all language is acceptable, that anybody has the right to be personally hurtful to get their point of view across. And this is where the rules of the code of conduct come into play. 
it must be said that differences of opinion are not just to preserve between political parties, they actually occur within parties. So the ability to be able to accept alternative views and the need for compromise at times is very important. Don't expect to enter into politics and get everything you want with ease. Effecting any major change will always be arduous. And I think just to conclude, um, I'd like to end with a simple analogy that I often use when I talk to people about what it's like uh, being a local councillor. When I became elected as county councillor, I felt like I'd been handed a large chisel and been told to face a 50 foot thick wall, which represents the challenges ahead in terms of progressing change. You will have an idea that you want to progress, so you begin to chip away at that wall. Over time, you'll start to make inroads, and occasionally you may spot a crack that you can exploit. Sometimes that crack may, can be more difficult to penetrate than it first looks. It can take years. Or you might get lucky, and that crack in the wall may be a way through. And to give you a couple of examples, um, something very simple on a local level, I wanted to get some double yellow lines laid down on a piece of road notorious for collisions. For one reason or another, it took nearly four years to achieve involving the authority and the local community, four years. Another example, one of my biggest ambitions is to reinstate a water fountain in East Grinstead. But after four years and a lot of obstacles, both politically and process driven, I'm beginning to think that that is one part of the 50 foot wall that must be about 100 foot thick, as I've yet to find a crack to exploit that one. So politics can be cruel, and the processes that go with it can be painfully slow, or they can just be painful. But the important thing to remember is that you have to stay focused and committed. Be realistic and accept that you will be unlikely to achieve everything you set out to achieve in the manner and time scale within you wish, which you wish to achieve it. But there are many things that you will achieve where you will make a difference. And that's what you must hold on to, because that is what matters. But whatever you do, just don't give up and hold on tight to that chisel. Thanks very much, Yvette. Thank you so much, um, Jackie, for that amazing and really intriguing speech. Um, it's given me and I think the audience as well a very good insight as to what a, council, a local councillor is like and uh, just thank you for your time as well for coming on here. So we have a few questions um, to ask so uh, hopefully you're ready to answer them. So the first one is, do you believe in recent years that our freedom of speech has been restricted as a result of, so of social restrictions on freedom of speech, such as cancel culture? Um, I think there has, yeah. I think I don't think we are quite as free um, to say what we like. I think, um, you know, particularly some of the older generations who grew up when, you know, a certain type of language was acceptable um, are particularly struggling with what is now considered to be unacceptable. And I think to a degree that does shut down debate. And I think that that's very unfortunate. And what I'd like to see is that there is a tolerance between what people um, today consider as acceptable and recognize that in the past, what was acceptable then, that, but may not be considered acceptable now is not necessarily said in a vein um, to become offensive, to be offensive. And I think we have a little way to go there uh, in terms of of bridging that gap so I, I do think yeah that is it is a bit of a shame um, that people are really wary of of and and think about what they say uh, when they're talking rather than being being feeling free to be relaxed that said I don't think there is any excuse to be rude or offensive I think that's completely out of order and that would have been out of order 50 years ago uh, as well as today so there is a distinction cool so another question we have is how much do you think a uh, partisan journalism feeds into fake news and how dangerous is it, is it when it comes to influencing young people's views wow that's a difficult one um how how sorry could you say that again <laughs> if that, i need to digest that one how what was that how partisan yes yeah, so how how much do you think partisan journalism feeds into fake news and how dangerous mm. is it when it comes to influencing young people's views i think it feeds in a lot um, and I and I do worry actually because I think no uh, news is so any kind of news fake or real and it's difficult to tell now um, is 
you know, so easy to access through social media. I think social media, you know, plays a huge part. And I think, you know, has to has to have a responsibility here to ensure that fake news doesn't filter through. And I do I do appreciate that they, you know, the the media giants do try to go to lengths to filter out um, fake news. Um, personally, I I have to say I stopped reading. I, I read I do read things online, but I, it was interesting. I was listening to the discussion earlier and being a conservative voter, I don't always read the Telegraph. I do actually read the Guardian as well. And I think, you know, those of us that are perhaps a little bit older do tend to, you know, to take a consensus view. And we look at a number of newspapers um, online. But I think perhaps people that are younger, you know, with political, you know, with, with certain viewpoints and have certain le leanings can perhaps fall into the trap of, of, you know, kind of sticking to one news outlet and, and being heavily influenced. And I think if we could all adopt that view where we just took a broad consensus and, you know, even if you are a, a Labour supporter, have a look at the Telegraph, you know, like if you're a Conservative supporter, look at the Guardian and try to find some, some kind of middle ground in between. I think that that would be useful. But I do think... Um, we are in a bit of a dangerous space with uh, the way news is reported now and how easily it is reported. It's it's really, really quite difficult. And, it, and it's down to us sort of personally to try and, you know, see the wood for the trees, really, isn't it? And to try and work out what we think is real and not real. And I think that's really difficult. I think that's difficult for all of us, not just young people. Someone's question was actually something? what you're... Oh yeah. Sorry, sure. So I, I really agree with you. I especially think it's so important that people listen to lots of different, especially opposing news sources. And I think like about partisanship, like you know, supporting um, newspapers being able to to support one party. I think it's a really difficult balance because obviously our press is they regulate themselves, so you know, so they're free of government interference. But then there also needs to be, um, you know, people who ensure that that this regulation is effective. So I think it's such a difficult balance between government interference and holding holding them account holding um, new newspapers accountable, especially for, you know, after the phone hacking scandal and things. And I think also um, there are very powerful relationships between um, politicians and media. And I think that is something that should probably be more transparent. Um, but yeah, I, I do to answer your question, like I do agree that partisan journalism does feed, does to some degree feed into fake news because obviously everyone has vested interests um, mm. and yeah I, I definitely agree with you that people should because of these you know, vested, you know everyone has vested interests because of these that people do have a responsibility to look at both sides of the argument and both opposing um, newspapers that have different political leanings. Mm. I think there's a um, I think it's a dangerous line to tread if we start to try and put controls on the media from, from a government perspective. And, and I know exactly what you're saying. It is about trying to um, find that balance. And we do have the sort of press standards, sort of complaints, um, sort of committee. I can't remember what it's exactly called now. But, you know, newspapers can be held to account. They can also be privately prosecuted. I mean, there's obviously the big famous one recently, of uh, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, you know, where she, um, she got a summary judgment in her favour. Um, which you know didn't particularly please the newspapers. I mean, I believe that's probably gone to appeal. But you know, there are ways that they do get held to account. But I do, I don't agree that they should be controlled. But I do agree that we need to give give um, give give people confidence that they are you know that they uphold certain standards and, and what their their responsibility to, to report the news accurately. I agree. So another question we have is. Does the riot at the Capitol in January prove that some free speech is dangerous? And what is the line between free speech and hate speech? Oh gosh, these are really difficult questions. Um, did you say, I lost that at the beginning, the riots in January, did you say? Yeah, so the riots in the Capitol in January, does that yeah. sort of, um, Wait, let me get the actual question up, oops. <laughs> Does the riot at, at the Capitol in January prove that some free speech is dangerous? And what is the line between free speech and hate speech? Well, um, well, the, the, the lines of hate speech are determined in law. Um, 
and some would argue that it that law doesn't go far enough um you know i mean rioting in the capital um people would argue that 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 is freedom of expression um others would argue that that was just rioting uh, and you know people trying to force their opinions on others and it's, it's difficult to you know see where you draw the line on that but i mean hate speech is clearly defined in law and there are there are people that are saying it, it should go further for example um to be intensely rude to a politician doesn't come within the rules of hate speech um you know it, it's not defined and yet you know people could be very insulting and hurtful to a politician if you threaten them with with you know death or anything like that that's criminal but in terms of you know insulting them for their political views um that's not considered hate speech so um it's it's just a very fine line very difficult one to answer that in fact um and so should freedom of speech be regulated in schools to prevent teachers and other people spreading misinformation as well as sort of um material so for example like anti-capitalist material should that be banned um well teachers are in a school not to um express political views either way um they are there to provide our children with an education so they shouldn't i wouldn't expect teachers to be teaching something that would um influence children you know politically either way um i think there's a space in school to um and i wish there was actually to teach um properly about local democracy and, and about politics um in a, in a neutral way um but i don't think um i mean i wouldn't i, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with banning free speech i mean that the whole phrase just scares me um but um at the same time it's not i don't consider that it's the to um, provide political opinion either way. Do you mind if I quickly interject? I was going to say I, I completely agree and I think schools are safe spaces where you know kids you know we, we have developing brains and we should be able to um, you know exchange ideas and stuff freely without really the issue of having to be penalised or you know for, for saying something that might offend someone and also to move on sorry to for the last question about um about, I think it was, um, does freedom of speech show, does the riot, riot show that freedom of speech can be dangerous? I think there is a difference between um, like having a platform and, and having freedom of speech. So I do think obviously the riots did show that freedom of speech can be dangerous. Having a platform, I feel like is perhaps more of a privilege rather than a right because, you, because freedom of speech is the actual you know, ability to, sh to share your ideas. But I think having a huge platform with millions of followers is more of a privilege so um yeah so i just wanted to quickly just say that that i um yeah <laughs> sorry if i can also say something as well as we said in the um powerpoint just because you have a right to a freedom of speech doesn't necessarily mean that you like have to do it. it's not it's not something you have to do and there are many good reasons like it's just good manners to do this and also, um, it, uh, you don't want to offend people. For sure. And um, this is for Jackie. So when you first started your role as councillor, what is something that surprised you the most about your role? And what was your most memorable part of your job? Wow. Um, when I very first became a councillor, um, I was a local town councillor and I for some reason, I just expected to get absolutely deluged with complaints from from residents, and uh, I got absolutely nothing, um, which totally surprised me. And um, I think the other thing that really surprised me about being a parish a town councillor um, was that was my first experience of working in the public sector. I know it was local government, but you know it was public sector, and. Uh, I couldn't believe how very slow everything felt very slow and very process driven and you, you'll often hear you know residents will say gosh why does it take so long um everything you know everything takes so long you know what you might decide one day takes six months <laughs> to to get a decision on can take six months and 
I, I find I found that very frustrating. Um, the bit I've en I enjoy the most about this role, uh, which I alluded to, was you know just being in touch with the community and being able to make a difference. Now, um, on a local, I mean, obviously, um, you know me as the cabinet member for uh, children, which is a strategic role. But in my local role, I do a lot of things for individual residents, um, you know, sorting out their problems. And those are things that never, ever hit the headlines. You know, if I put in a, a pedestrian crossing, that will hit the headlines. But, you know, helping somebody sort out, you know, being overcharged for care home fees and getting that sorted, which means the absolute world to them um, will never hit the headlines. Um, but those those things, those things that you do for individual res residents mean the absolute most to me because it's had such a massive um, impact on their lives for the better. And I think the next question is kind of for the youth cabinet. Um, so what are the pros and cons of having a physical debate and discussion opposed to having social media or online? Um, I, sorry, I, I thought I'd start. Um, I think definitely, um, I think body language and the way, the way things are said are, I think we've all been in a situation where we, we've text someone and they've completely um, kind of not really, they've, they've not missed they've not understood our intention so I think definitely having a physical debate is a lot better and obviously I know it's difficult now because of Covid but I, and I also do think that um when you actually see it's so easy just to reduce someone to some um like little profile picture but if you actually see them in person I think it does it helps you you know realize that they, they are real people and um also I think it's just so easy on social media just to report to resort to name calling and you know that deals in with the whole respect thing if you actually see someone in person I think you respect them a lot more I think it's a lot easier to follow the rules that we set out so asking questions um, making an argument appeal to your morals I think that is all just so much more easier when it's a physical debate and also you you don't want to you don't want to take it as far as an un, you know a personal remark because you are actually seeing the person and a lot of the times debates are happening in classrooms with your classmates so you, you know you don't want to really upset someone so I think it's a lot more of a calmer um, constructive um, educational atmosphere when it's actually like physically in person rather than social media. I, I yeah. would agree as well because you can you convey a lot of emotion with the way you talk like your body language that can't be conveyed into a text message um, even though there are like um, emotion, like emojis you can put in, you can't see the like intentions and the emotion that comes behind the words. So that's why it's definitely easier, more constructive to actually have a physical debate. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, so where does belief become extreme or extremist? I think that's a very interesting question. Um. I would say um, I think it's the um, intimidation and um, when it's when it's um, inciting hatred and inciting uh, violence, I think that's a big defining factor and causing someone else, you know, distress or alarm or, you know, most likely causing someone stress or uh, alarm. I think that's when the line is drawn. I think when, yeah, exactly when, it, when it's inciting anger and, and hatred and I think it's the actual physical impacts it could have, you know, I think that's when it becomes extreme. Cool. So, um, so what are some of the ways that people who are too young to vote can get their voices heard? Um, so I'd say definitely join a pressure group. A lot of them are free. Um, you know, I can think, first thing I can think of Ex Extinction Rebellion, they have local, um groups obviously it is a national group as well, and that's free to join um i think debate debating clubs um i think debating teams are a really good idea there's you can start one in your school there's programs such as model un which do um debates i think our youth cabinet is a really good example um our youth cabinet and uk youth parliament are really good um ways of participating um protests just just things out oh, e-petitions i think e-petitions are also really important um i see a lot on my instagram but i think these are just really good ways of just, just getting your voices heard and I, and I know at our age it can just feel like we're completely left out and i would also recommend 
um, studying politics because it really, um, you know, opens your mind to a political career. And, you know, eventually we could be the ones that are actually making the decisions. Um, so yeah, I do, those are the ways that I would say of getting involved and getting our voices heard. Yeah, also just to add on what to Lottie has said, um, in school, uh, in schools like school cabinet, um, anything like that is also a good way, even though it's only in your school, it like teaches you how to be engaged in politics, how to argue your point, everything like that. And then you could you could join like a youth cabinet or just something where you can get your views across and you can make a change. Mm -hmm. And there's also, sorry, I was going to quickly say, there's lots of um, public speaking competitions. So I forgot what it was called, but there was, I had one in year 10 um, and that usually lots of council members attend them. And they're just a really good way of, um, I mean, they're quite nerve wracking, but they are a really good way. Of, so if you have a debate team, they're a really good way of actually feeling like you're, you're doing something, like you're actually adding to the conversation. So um, do you believe council culture and the restriction of freedom of speech is leading down a path in which freedom of speech will completely be or mostly eradicated? Um, it's that's a very difficult question. I would say that it's quite an extreme, it's quite a dramatic view, but I, I do agree that, that um, you know, these regimes of where the question is, um, you know, where you're not, you're denied free speech, they don't happen overnight. A lot of them are very gradual. So as Katrina was, uh, was saying about um, Nazi Germany, the restrictions on free speech did start off very gradually. So they started off um, banning jokes, things like that. And then, you know, five years later, it was banning books, banning films, banning all types of media that don't agree with their views. Um, I do think cancel, cult cancel culture, oh, it's a hard one. I think there is an argument that um, cancel culture is justified because it needs, um, you know, it, it um, you know, it, it stops hate, it stops, the thing about social media is that anyone can have a huge platform and and people that weren't necessarily, you know, have the responsibilities or don't ne weren't necessarily meant to have a large platform do gain a lot of followers. Um, and that kind of aligns with what I was saying that having a huge platform to a point is more of a privilege than a right. So I think that should have more stricter restrictions. But I do think council culture is a problem, but especially seeming as a lot of it is done on social media and a lot of these social media executives are not democratically elected. They're very wealthy people, and there is a real lack of transparency as to who who gets to decide who gets a social media account and who doesn't. Um, and also, I do think that a lot of people justify council culture by saying it's protecting it's protecting people from being offended. But I do think, unless obviously, unless it does inspire like racial hatred and and is horrible, I do think people do need to hear questions and they, they do need to hear things to decide if they're offensive or not and I think trying to shelter people from hearing something can be quite kind of patronizing so for example if you're a, I've heard a lot of recently university speakers have been um, like deplatformed so where they've been invited to speak and then there's been such a huge student backlash where they've been um, not allowed to speak anymore and so I do think that that is you know we do need to hear views and I think for example let's say there was a a speaker at a university that many would regard as sexist and saying oh we can't possibly have them because you know we, we want to protect our female students from being offended that sounds very um patronizing and I think um you know I think people are tough enough I think I mean obviously there are exceptions um I'm not talking about horrible things but I think people are tough enough to be offended and I also think you have to be very um, self-absorbed and um, arrogant to think that no one has the right to ever cross you or ever offend you. So yeah, that's what I would say. Jackie, do you want to add to that as well? I was going to say, I agree with that. I actually think it's up to us to determine whether or not we find something personally offensive and not have for others to cancel out stuff for us. I think that that's a dangerous avenue for us to go around with and I completely agree with Lottie and everything that she said. And for the final question, do you think it should be made illegal to report news inaccurately? 
Yeah, I think this one's towards Jackie. I thought there's an echo, sorry. Um, could you repeat that? Is that for me? Yeah, so do you think it should be made illegal to report news inaccurately? It should be made illegal? Well, I think when newspapers do report news that is fake or inaccurate and they get found out, they do get penalised, but, um, you know, it is really down to somebody to report them. Um, but yeah, of course, it should be illegal. In fact, I, you know, I think if it's proved that it's inaccurate or it's wrong, then 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 there is a process in place. Um, but um, yeah, everybody has a duty to report, you know, uh, the correct news. But I just think it's out of control um, for all the reasons that have been mentioned. You know, it's it's very easy, um, as Lossie had said, to put stuff, for example, on social media where, you know, these are huge entities where there is stuff flying around all over the place and, and nobody seems to be accountable. I mean, you know, one of my massive pet hates is I, I see things on social media and you report them and they come back and they basically say, well, it hasn't violated anything. And I think to myself, I'm pretty sure that has violated something. And I think to an extent, um, I certainly feel as a user, um, I feel unheard and I don't know how you... Uh, the younger generations feel. So I, th I think there's more work to do in social media land, but I think newspapers, um, you know, they do, they are, you know, they are basically watched and they are held to account when, when they fall foul. Thank you so much for coming, Jackie and Lottie and Katerina, you guys did amazing. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this webinar up. So Thank you so much um, for taking the time to answer these questions and thank you everyone who has come down to watch. A uh, quick reminder to please fill out the feedback form which will be emailed to you tomorrow and follow our social media sites for your, uh, called Your Space West Sussex and sign up um, for our mental health webinar which is actually coming up next week as well. So um, you can go and do that. Um, so other than that, we are finished. So thank you so much. Thank you guys, bye.